So the term Rakbun Globab is, is what happens when we have right view. We would like to do good because we know it will help us to become a better person and will also help the other person. Globab means that we want to avoid all that's wrong so as not to create suffering in our own life and the other person. So you could say that right view is also connected with an idea of courage on the one hand and fear on the other hand. But usually we do not think that fear is a good thing. But in Buddhism, fear is actually uh, usually not seen. Uh, let me put it right. Uh, fear is not always seen as wrong. So uh, this is actually not a review. I have not talked about this yet. <laughs> so there is useless fear, fear that doesn't help us when we are not seeing things in a rational way. But there is also sometimes fearing for good things, like fearing the consequences of your actions or thinking about the, the things that we have to take into account, that we all grow old, sick, grow sick and die. This is part of life. And if we sometimes are a little bit afraid of that because we want to make sure that we are healthy, so we take good care of our health, we don't grow sick. And that, that, is, that is a normal part. But of course, when you go too far, as when you always try to avoid uh, looking old or something like that, as some people do, this is, this is kind of be when fear becomes irrational because old age is part of life. So there's sometimes fear can help us and sometimes not. So right view might give us a sense of fear, that's of a sense of rational fear that it's sometimes good to, to fear the consequences of your actions if you might hurt somebody or hurt yourself in the long term. And in that way, we might be demotivated to go choose a wrong path in life. But it also, uh, right view is also connected with courage, especially when it comes to the first quality, which is faith. Faith in Buddhism is not so much uh, faith, as I already mentioned before, uh, by the way, Faith is not so much a faith as in I'm subscribed to this or that religion or I embrace that this or that religion, but faith is more a sense of believing that every good thing you do will have an effect, even if no one knows. So if you see a beggar on the street, you give somebody something to that beggar and no one knows except for that beggar. And, and it doesn't matter if anyone knows if somebody praises you for that because there is an inherent mechanic in the world. There's an inherent, inherent structure in the world which causes good deeds to be rewarded in some way and which causes our wrong deeds to also have some effect. This we call sometimes karmic retribution. So that is not to say that karma is a sort of simple tit for tat thing. Like you have, you do this and you get that. It's a bit complicated, so we have to study about it. But when you study about karma further, remember, keep in mind that it has both the effect of causing you to be more careful. If you want to avoid the word fear, you can also use the word careful. And on the other hand, it also, helps us to have more faith and confidence that goodness is a good thing. Faith in goodness. So I already mentioned this previous time, previous uh, uh, week, but this time you can see that the, the bullet points have increased. <laughs> um, karma will always ripen for the doer, not for anyone else. So karma is always a personal thing, okay? So this, this is a principle of karma. So karma, there is no such thing in Buddhism as group karma, uh, as, as some theosophical theories or something like that. There is no such thing like that. It may be that some people have a similar karma in the past, and therefore, for example, a lot of people might have a similar karma of having killed animals or having killed people in the past. And because of that, when they are sitting in a bus, they all have the same bus accident. 
and they all die. It's a very sad thing, but it's a hypothetical example. If that happens, it doesn't mean that all of these people have done exactly the same thing at the same time. It just means that certain similar deeds attract people to come to the same place at the same time to have to experience the effect of their karma. And again, with many of these examples, I have to say again, it's not like we are feeling that it's justified for anyone to die or for anyone to experience suffering because karma is not justice. It simply happens. And of course, it's always a sad thing when bad karma happens. A karma will always ripen in kind. That means that if, uh, in the example of the bus, somebody kills some animal or kills some human being, that at a certain point that person is going to be killed. But uh, there is some details here. Uh, there are some details. Um, of, as I already mentioned, intentional killing is much worse than unintentional. And also, if we are killing an animal which has a short lifespan, then you are taking away not so many years. But if you kill an animal with a long lifespan, it's a very serious thing. And usually those animals are much larger, so it also costs a lot more effort. There's a lot of calculation you can do, but in basically, it's not always necessary. You can just say that killing in any circumstance in, in Buddhism is wrong. But some people, they are concerned, you know, I've sometimes killed insects, is that bad? So, so there's differences between, you know, hitting a mosquito and killing it, which is a bad thing in Buddhism, and actually going out of your way to try and kill an elephant, which costs a lot of effort. There is some difference, there is some distinguishing distinguishing there. So karma will always ripen in kind. That means that the similar thing we have done in the past will ripen in kind, but not exactly the same thing. A karma that has been done will ripen as soon as it obtains an opportunity, and it will not obtain an opportunity if there is other karma which is in the way. So if we have done a lot of wrong things in our past, we might end up in a difficult situation in, the current, in our current life. And even though we have done a lot of good, that will not ripen because there's so much wrong going on in our current situation. But on the other hand, if a lot of our good deeds from the past ripen in the present, it may be that our wrong deeds, our bad deeds will not ripen. So there's a lot of sort of competition going on. But eventually, all karma must ripen at some point. But when somebody becomes enlightened and leaves this human life to attain nirvana, there is no ripening of karma anymore. But that's becoming a little bit uh, theoretical. Maybe we don't have to go there yet. A karma may not always ripen once, it may ripen more than once, depending on the intention, the strength of the deed, and the person to who you are acting. For example, if you give to, um, to, to feed a fish, okay, you, you feed a fish, that is a good thing to do because you are giving food to a fish. But if you give to somebody who is using that food uh, to do good deeds, to help other people, whether in a secular sense or in a religious sense, that is even a stronger deed. So it's often a stronger uh, gift to give to people rather than animals because animals cannot always use it to do good. But, you know, there's of course exceptions, but in general, in general it, it matters how our gift is being used. Of course, all giving is good, but I'm just explaining the principle that a karma may be stronger when there's actually a lot of effect of the thing that we have caused. 
when a karma ripens, it becomes exhausted. You cannot uh, expect, a karma will not be eternal. As you know, in Buddhism, there is no such thing as eternal, except for Nirvana, but I already said that I'm not going to discuss Nirvana right now. <laughs> so when a karma ripens, it becomes exhausted. And this holds for both good karma and bad karma. And a karma must always ripen sooner or later. It cannot be fled from. So these are quite some, that's quite a, some stuff for thought. But maybe let's, uh, I think I already discussed this, right? Well, there's three things which karma is not. So that's important. The law of karma is not blaming everything on your past karma. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I already showed uh, that, that cartoon uh, before. I'm not sure if, uh, if you've seen this one. I think it's called Gilbert, Gilbert, Gilbert right? I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. Gilbert, with a Gilbert? D. Yeah, I think I showed you this before, right? Gilbert. I believe in karma. That means I can do bad things to people all day long, and I assume they deserve it. So in this kind of case, uh, the little dog, I think his name is Gilbert Dilbert. Yeah, you, you said it just, but I, I missed that part. Um, so the little dog is understanding karma in the wrong way. It's a funny cartoon. And it illustrates that karma is not uh, about, you know, other people attracting something and you just have to act along. <laughs> like I met a guy the other, some time ago, and uh, he said he just killed a mouse. He did believe in karma. Uh, but he didn't feel bad about killing that mouse because it was the karma of that mouse to be killed. So that is not car how karma works. Karma is always personal. You cannot just do something because it's your fate is, or it's the fate of somebody else to do that. <laughs> and also, um, there is old karma versus new karma. Old karma is the karma that you've done in the past, which might have an effect in our present life. Maybe in the past means in the beginning of our life or in the previous life. And there's new karma, which is the karma we are, we are doing right now and which may have an effect in the future, or will have usually have an effect in the future. Uh, this is an important uh, thing to distinguish. For example, a burglar might break into our house and they might steal some, some things. Okay, this is a new karma. That is their new karma. It's not our new karma. What is it? It's our old karma. It's our old karma that attracts these burglars to come and steal things from our house. But it's their new karma. And in the future, they also will have to find that their, that their possessions will be stolen again because of the karma they do now. So you can see that karma is continually interacting. The fact that the burglars chose our house of all places is because our karma, but they are also creating a new karma. So that is the complicated, the detailed part of the law of karma. If we can understand this, we will understand karma more deeply. And karma is also never about blaming it, um, blaming it on God's will because karma is just a natural force. It's also not destiny because there's always the liberty or the freedom to choose to more or less extent, but there's always some part that we can choose in the present moment. We are never completely determined by karma. That is, uh, it's only some part that is determined, but not all, everything. One uh, American uh, monk and teacher, Buddhist monk and teacher, he explained it as a river, which is like uh, flowing. I think the technical word is meandering. A river that is flowing left to left and right. And eventually, uh, you know, that, that river is going into a certain direction. There is some part that is determined. We cannot just have the river go back, you know, but there is some freedom as to how the river is going to flow, if it's going to go a lot to the left or a lot to the right. Our lives may be partly determined, but not all. 
there is some there's always some freedom and for many people there's a lot of freedom So this is some part that I would like to explain. And now let's see if uh, this is already a lot of detail. So just the short, uh, some examples that I would like to end with. Um, these are some examples about the law of karma, okay? For example, you kill living beings and it causes you to be killed or have a short life. You give up killing and you are compassionate with living beings. You show compassion, you are kind, it causes you to have a long life. This, this is for both animals and human beings. Injuring beings causes sickness and not doing so causes health. Being angry causes you to be ugly. Not being angry causes you to be beauty, beautiful. Not being angry or here also means, you know, showing kindness, the opposite of being angry showing kindness, forgiveness, etc. If you're a person who is often envious of other people, then you might find that you, it's hard for you to become a, uh, fully accepted as a leader in any position. You might always have to be number two in any company or position that you are. So, uh, this is some effect of the fact that you don't want other people to to have success. So you also are limited in your own life. On the other hand, the word not envious here also encompasses the sense of feeling happy with other people's success. If you are in a habit of finding joy in other people's success, then you will also find that influence comes more easily in your life. These are all examples, okay? As I said before, you don't have to believe me. These are things we can study and learn about and we can see if it's true or not in our own lives. Uh, not giving to clergy, which can be any religion, provided that that religion causes people to prosper and grow. Not, uh, I mean, prosper and go in a spiritual sense. Not giving to clergy can lead to poverty. If you never give, that is not only clergy, but giving in general, then you will also not be given to. That is the mechanic, that is the, 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 the way the law of karma works. Giving, on the other hand, causes wealth. Being arrogant or looking down on others causes you to be in a position which is looked down on. Okay, here the traditional term is birth in a low-class family, but of course, uh, in every society that has its own forms, the, in every society that may be slightly different ways that karma is expressed. On the other hand, if you are being very respectful and humble, then you tend to be born in a family which is respected. Not asking questions or studying the Dharma or the, the, the wise teachings causes you not to develop wisdom. And the opposite, if you are in the habit of seeing uh, people who are wise and asking them things, then you develop wisdom. These are some examples that are mentioned in the Buddhist text. Now, as I mentioned before, karma is never a simple thing, okay? There's a lot of complex, complexity to the law of karma. So some things uh, may not be uh, as easily understood as I explain it now, but these are some examples that the Buddha raises himself. And uh, they are general principles, but in, in our daily lives in practice, often karma interact, causing a very complex situation. Just like you cannot easily uh, determine when a person has eaten a lot of food during the day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. If you were to look at that person's stomach, it would be very difficult to determine which is which meal. <laughs> then uh, in the same way, karma is a mixture of many things and it's very difficult to determine which karma is what. But if we know the principles, we can try. If we smile more to others, will it come back to us? If we give more to others, will it come back to us? If we are more respectful to 
people who are worthy of our respect, will that come back to us in some way? There's a story about a little kid and he was uh, um, going on a camping trip with his parents. Uh, maybe you know the story. And uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was wandering off a little bit when his parents were, were, were talking about something or was just looking at some nature or something like that. And as he was wandering off, and this was just a little kid, okay? He was still learning about the world around him, as we all are, by the way. And uh, this little kid, he, he came into a sort of valley. And uh, in this valley, there was an echo. Uh, you call that an echo, right, in English? Yeah. So as he was talking to himself, as children do, the echo came back. So he was frustrated. He thought there was a little kid that was hiding there somebody who had a similar voice to him. So he said, who's that? And then the voice came back, who's that? So that made him even more angry. And he said to him, if you really are trying to tease me, come out and we'll fight. And then the voice came back in exactly the same way, which made him even more angry. And then eventually he ran back to his parents and he, he, he ran to his father and said, is it true that there's a little naughty, naughty kid over there? And the father, he said, he immediately understood it was a very wise father. And he said, you know what you could do? That little naughty kid, you should try and speak nicely to him and it will come back to you as well. And so the little kid ran back, or maybe not running, but maybe he carefully came back, went back to the valley. And then he said, little kid, let's talk and have talk. Let's, let's, let's have some good talk together, uh, something like that. I don't know how, <laughs> how, people, how children talk in English language. <laughs> And uh, anyway, this voice, of course, it came back and uh, he was very happy about that. He said, we are good friends. And then the voice came back, we are good friends. And of course, the child didn't really understood what just had happened, but he learned a very important lesson, which is true, that everything we do in life does come back. It may not be in a similar tit for tat fashion, as I just explained with this example of this kid, but in generally the things we, we throw at the world, they will be thrown back to us. So if we do a lot of good things, good words and good thoughts, then these will also come back to us. Even if nobody knows about our good deeds, they will come back to us. And the same holds for everything we do wrong. <laughs> so it's best to, to lead a good and positive life. As I mentioned before, it's not the case uh, in, when we study about this subject that we should all live in fear, but it's rather that it's a sense of caution that will help us and combine with a sense of courage to always do good, even when people around us do not always understand. As we discussed before about uh, meditation not always being understood in the past, but right now it's becoming more accepted. So eventually when we do good often, we will persist, be able to persist, then that good thing, those good things come back to us. So I'd like to finish on that positive note for today. Coming up uh, next time, I would like to talk more about how karma might relate to some principles in, uh, in nature, for example, as it's studied by science, as in quantum physics, for example. And this is, uh, 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 may help you to better understand, but uh, I will also like to discuss more, uh, some more examples of how karma works in our general, in our daily life. So are there any questions or comments about this for this moment? I have a comment. I just thought that that was really beautiful. And uh, thank you so much for uh, 